The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the standard in the rare coin grading industry. Celebrating 35 years of coin grading excellence, you can find out how the firm is grading coins with its new specials, new labels, and new premium offerings by going to www.pcgs.com. And also, if you're interested, be sure to take part of the new coin hunt. They have details on the site. You may want to check that out. As the beginning of the year marks when new coins for the new year enter circulation. If you find your coins early enough and send them in, you may get a prize. I'm with Chris Bullfink. I'm Charles Morgan, Coin Week editor. And we're going to do part two of a conversation about collecting coins in albums, folders, what have you. The first part, we talked about collecting coins uh, in uh, from circulation, pulling them out of change at face value, putting them in uh let's just say entry level coin folders, uh, something many collectors do at one point in their collecting experience. Uh, We're going to amp that up a little bit in this conversation today. We're going to talk about, let's just say a more advanced approach, a more thoughtful approach to doing this by putting them in more protective uh, coin albums. Uh, For the purposes of our our conversation, we're going to talk about Dansko albums, uh, as I have a few here at my office. However, uh, Lighthouse makes albums, Littleton makes albums, uh, there's Intercept albums, other albums you can buy other than Dansko. Dansko has sort of been a hobby staple for several decades um, they were actually the makers of the albums uh, for the FAO series, a series I collect. But uh, we're going to talk specifically about U.S. coins today. Uh, before we get into that, Chris and I have a few little pieces of information that happened in the news. Uh, we'll start with Chris talking about a very crazy price for a 1962 proof Franklin half dollar. Yeah, so great collections uh, recently uh, auctioned off a Franklin half dollar that on its face doesn't really seem all that remarkable. It's 1962, like Charles said. So the coin is certified proof 65 by PCGS, which is not a remarkable grade. And 1962 isn't really a remarkable coin. It's struck pretty late in the series life. It was they were retired after 1963. Uh, but, you know, to look at uh, on its face, the coin isn't there's nothing really remarkable about it. But it's sold for this massive price because of its holder. So this whole story kind of inverts the old numismatic truism that you should buy the coin, not the holder. And so the coin is in a white label rattler, which is a first generation PCGS holder. So this is among the first coins encapsulated by the service. The The full certification number is 1080333, which some think uh, might allude to this being the 333rd coin uh, that the service certified. But they do what is known definitively is that it is among the first 350 graded by the service. So, you know, such an early holder and this coin being one of the first ever encapsulated, uh, that apparently appealed to people enough that uh, 31 bids were recorded and it ultimately sold for $3,612, which is a pretty remarkable price. So yeah, that was a really neat story. And, you know, I've heard about people, you know, paying a lot of money for coins in really uh, in older generation holders among sort of the earliest uh, by the different services. But so this offers a really vivid illustration of how much, you know, a holder can be worth. Well, when you think about it, I mean, one of the things that attracts people to coins is rarity. And, uh, you know, we've we've had commenters who uh, kind of uh, were, I don't know, Maybe even I wouldn't use the word offended, but uh, maybe surprised and sort of ha- had a, a sense of uh, I don't want the coin hobby to be going this way. And like, what kind of uh, what kind of person would pay so, such a price of money for uh, a coin like this? I think I'm being a little bit polite, um, but uh, but the reality is that like numismatics, there's like there's pretty much no wrong way to do it. And, uh, and if, if you go into it because like you think the holders themselves are an interesting, uh, and collectible part of the numismatic hobby, then guess what? You're probably right. I mean, I don't know the last time I've seen a white rattler with that low of a cert number over the course of the next 10 years, you're not going to find the other 300 first graded coins from PCGS. And I'm reminded of the prototype black core holder that uh, I was able to review uh, from Mark Salzberg's collection when NGC was uh, just starting to formulate what its holder would look like. And, you know, it had a St. Gaudens $20 gold coin in it. But if you put that 
Bitcoin and that holder on the market at a major auction? I mean, who's to say it wouldn't bring heavy multiples over what the coin's value would be just for the fact that it's a unique item. It's a very, you know, the very first NGC holder coin ever, you know, as they were formulating what their brand would look like. So with the White Rattler, you're seeing the beginning of a very important period of numismatic history. Just like, you know, if uh, Colonel Green's uh, coin records came up for sale, uh, people would pay for his books just to see what he bought and what he thought of them. Or when uh, the Newman collection uh, was was marketed, the coin envelopes that belonged to Green were part of the pedigree and they were they were included in the in the sale. So people do care about packaging. And in this case, the packaging uh, happens to be plastic with a white uh, computer printed insert, and it's a and it's a really cool price. And if it was a a really interesting coin, not a common proof Franklin half dollar, who's to say the price wouldn't have been even higher? It probably would have been really high. And I wonder, I wonder if if the prices would go up or down if you could if you could positively identify the order in which the coins were certified. So if you found. I, for, just for my own personal curiosity, I'd love to know what the first coin ever certified by PCGS was. Before the show, I, I you know, I, I went through a few Google searches and, and read a few articles on the the grading company's websites to try to figure out, you know, which what was the first coin that they graded, and I you know, I didn't find anything. But which I didn't obviously I wasn't looking particularly hard, but. I don't know what the first. I don't know what the first U.S. coin they graded is, but I do, in fact, know what the first uh, world coin they graded was. Oh, really? Wait, well, what is that? I'm curious. It was the uh, 19, uh, 1911 pattern Canadian dollar. Oh, really? Oh, that's a cool coin. Yeah, and um, they they did a big uh, full page display on it in the numismatist when they announced that they were accepting world coins, and that was the first coin they graded. I'm pretty oh, sure the first the first American coin they graded wasn't a major rarity. No, it was just just something that someone submitted that wasn't particularly rare. I, I should mention that the uh, the final price was three thousand six hundred twelve dollars and thirty eight cents. In case that extra thirty eight cents makes any difference to our listeners, um, yeah. And I also wonder not only about the first coins that they certify, but if you found like the tenth coin, would it command a significantly higher premium than this coin? I mean, I, I don't know how many um, old white rattlers uh, are out there, but and obviously they they command a pretty serious premium i guess whoever uh, whoever whoever's collection of that coin came out of i imagine they're probably thanking their lucky stars that uh they didn't break it out to have it upgraded it's uh you know it ended up being worth more intact than if they'd uh, cracked it out well another thing that happened in the news today uh this week is that the uh Bureau of Engraving and Printing uh, has resumed production of the $100 Federal Reserve note at its uh, Washington, D.C. facility. Uh, the issue had uh, been suspended from production there uh, for nearly a decade due to printing problems. Uh, so every $100 note that uh, would have been produced uh, from 2013 onwards uh, would have been uh, produced at the Fort Worth, Texas facility. This may or may not um, matter to collectors of paper money in the sense that, you know, the very current issues may not be something they're collecting today, uh, but uh, collectors in the future will probably make note of this, uh, this important uh, change in development. And uh, I'm sure the notes will uh, not be immediately available for circulation, but may uh, come out at a future point and, um, it's not clear to me when that schedule is scheduled to happen, but that's a that's a certainly a development. The uh, the old money factory in Washington D.C. Uh, getting our highest uh, circulating denomination of paper money back into production. Why were they only? Do you have any sense as to why they were only printing them at Fort Worth? Uh, Is there was there a reason for it, or just that's just how? It I think out? I think there was a printing error that uh, that was uh, what was happening and. Uh, with the uh, series 2009 notes and uh, that they had an office of the inspector general report look into it to try to figure out what was going on because they were trying to, uh, to, to remedy the issue. There was like uh, different solvents that they were trying to use. Um, and it just turned out that the Fort Worth facility was able to print the notes and the DC facility wasn't. And it took apparently quite a bit of time for the approval process to get underway and for them to, to get to the point where they could print the notes yeah, uh, and that that may be uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, is factored into whatever the redesigns or updates to the notes that are probably scheduled on a fairly routine basis. Um, you know, given the fact that like advanced printing technology can easily counterfeit 
you know, most of the uh, older forms of currency. Uh, who knows? I mean, the United States has used a, a cloth paper formulation for its paper money for quite some time, as, uh, even, even as other countries have uh, gradually slipped into uh, polymer notes and other technology. So, you know, I wonder if, if at some point we'll follow suit or if we'll keep our, our traditional, uh, our traditional uh, paper in place. So uh, we wanted to get into uh, basically a, a discussion of the strategies that may work best for you when it comes to putting together uh, maybe a better collection of uh, coins and albums. Um, I would say that this is sort of an intermediate step between taking coins out of circulation, you know, at face value and accepting what you find. Uh, and uh, buying coins and certified holders uh, with um, a focus on uh, the precise grade of the coin. I have probably six or eight Dansko albums. Have you ever put one of these albums together, Chris? No, I never have. That's something that I think I always sort of meant to do and never had the presence of mind to just pick up a folder and just start getting type coins. So I never have, but... At some point in the next year or so, I'd like to just get a couple dance go albums and, and start. But in answer to your question, no, I have not. Yeah, so so the, the the interesting thing is like putting a dance go album is really about the process. Um, the the least fulfilling ones that I've ever completed have been the Eisenhower dollar one, the Susan B. Anthony dollar one. Uh, I- any album that you can essentially buy your way through and like one trip to the coin shop in the long term isn't really going to feel that satisfying to you. Um, you know, well, you can, you can buy them already assembled. I mean, there are dealers who have, you know, like a full set of type to, to pick a coin we were talking about earlier in the show. You can buy full uncirculated sets of Franklin halves. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would never, I would, I would never do it. I would just never. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm nor nor would I. I'm just saying that they do sell complete dance go albums. So you could either put it together yourself at a shop or at a show, or you could buy it completed. But again, I I wouldn't endorse buying a completed album either. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and the reason is, well, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, the first off, the the, the cost associated with it. So well, let's say you're going to get a Franklin half dollar. Well, every Franklin half dollar is made out of ninety percent silver. So you have. Uh, you know, many ounces of silver that you're dealing with from 1948 to 1963. Um, the coin dealer gets to pick which coins to put in the album. Um, and they're doing it as in a package deal for the indiscriminate buyer, even if they're saying they're BU or choice BU. What does that really mean? I mean, well, you know what I mean? That, that doesn't <laughs> always mean a range of grades. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that respect, and also you, you have, you basically at that point, you didn't buy coins, you bought a product, a finished product. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much attention you're going to pay to it or how much the journey is going to mean anything to you. If you open your priority mailbox in the mail and you have everything done. I, I felt that way. Like I said, about the Ike dollar, uh, dance go I put mm-hmm. together because uh, pretty much I had all the coins lying around. Um, they're all mint state because I had a registry set uh, collection of like dollars and uh, and these were ones that I didn't get graded. I mean, I didn't go crack out my MS sixty seven clads to put them in a dance go album. Um, so these were you know not as good as my my set registry set, and it was very easy to put together. Uh, I have in front of me though uh, three uh, sets that I. I've been working on for like 15 years and I haven't even finished. Um, one is a Jefferson nickel set, which isn't really that difficult to assemble. I mean, none of the coins are all that rare. We talked about this last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in my, in my uh, set, this would go from the beginning of the series in 1938. And I think the last ones I put in here were probably 2000. What is this date? Uh, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, the 2011 were the last ones I put in here. I have room for 12, 13, 14, 15, I think. Up to 2015. Hmm. Don't take, don't quote me on that. I guess you will. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but every single, every single one of these coins is a mint set coin. So think about what the cheap mint sets are. You know, you're talking about the mint sets in the post silver period, you know, when they started producing them again after, uh, in 68. So 68 to the present, you're just buying mint sets. You're cutting them out. You're putting them in here. So that's a lot of mint sets. Or you can buy them as individuals, singles. Coin dealers sometimes will have these in two by two flips or in rolls. You know that they've they they sell. You can do it that way. 
Uh, the coins start getting a little tougher once you go uh, before 64 uh, uh, and because you have the silver content. So if you're buying them from mint sets, uh, you're, at a certain point, you're starting to buy double mint sets. And double mint sets have two of every silver coin released that year. Uh, a lot of these tend to be toned coins but if they were original because the, the paper uh, tones the coins over time. Uh, and those come with a collector premium. Um, and so you may pay two or three hundred dollars for a mint set, which means that uh, you have all these other coins and not just the nickel. Um, you may decide to buy those coins as singles. Uh, and then again, you're running into the same situation that I find, uh, people who market coins as uncirculated don't always have uncirculated coins. This is why grading services exist folks. Uh, because like the seller, uh, always, uh, has a tendency or, or commercial benefit to oversell the coin. Uh, and then when you get the coins in hand, you may say, eh, this is a slider or this has been dipped or cleaned or whatever. Uh, one of the things I noticed about nickels, they all tone. Like they will all discolor. Uh, they, they typically turn yellow after a while. Yep. Um, so uh, so anyway, in this case, the thing that's holding me back is uh, probably going to hold a lot of you back as you start the early issues. The, the Like I said, the pre, in this case, it's the pre-60 issues. Each one of these coins I've had to buy individually. Um, and you see there are quite a few holes, especially when you get into the War Nickel set. Uh, but the Jefferson Nichols, it's a cool series put together. I would say as, a, as far as the challenge is concerned, there's not going to be a single mint set coin in here that's going to cost you more than maybe $15, $20. And, uh, and, and, and not very many are going to be in that price range. A lot of these are going to get for under a dollar. But even yeah, with that, it's taken a while. Well, I'd imagine that the most difficult... I'm curious, did you have... Were you looking for coins with full steps? Was that a requirement that you imposed on yourself, or were you just just mint state out of a mint set? You didn't need to. You didn't need the steps. I, I was basically looking for mint state um, uh, with uh, with a good amount of luster, like attractive coins. Like I wasn't. I used to. Uh, I used to when I was making my Eisenhower dollar set registry set. I, I wasn't just buying a coin that was pre-done. A lot of times I was making the coins. And what I mean by that is I was going out buying a lots of a lot of mint sets. I was putting those uh, breaking them down. I would every mint set I've ever bought off of eBay or from a, uh, from a coin dealer, I've actually cut up. And I'm not alone in that respect. I think a lot of collectors do this, uh, which uh, means that you can take the original mintage or uh, from any given year and count on, many of these sets being destroyed over time, you know, the coins being broken out. Sometimes someone only collects a half dollar. Well, they get the mint set, they grab their half dollar, they cut it out and the rest of the whatever. Sometimes the coins go into circulation. Sometimes they just put them in rolls or whatever. But I, I had a system. I, I would break down every single set I bought, even if I didn't like the coins, uh, because I didn't want to ever buy them again in the market. So I felt like, you know, if I was looking for Eisenhower dollars, the typical Eisenhower dollar for any given year in the mint set is going to be an MS64, maybe or lower. I didn't want to buy that set again, pay the shipping again, go through the hassle of selling it, taking a loss, then buying it again as somebody bundled it together, thinking that I was trying to find like better coins. So the way I avoided that is like I never bought the same set again because those sets didn't exist after I got my hands on them. And uh, so I would just put all the uncirculated coins I didn't like into tubes. I would sell the tubes. Problem solved. Yeah, that's not a bad strategy. That way you're still making a little bit of money and you can recoup some of uh, some or depending on what you sell them for all of your initial investment. So, right. So, so I would do that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think over the course of like maybe three or four years, I was actively doing this. I probably broke down about 1800 or 1900 mint sets from like 1973 to 1981. So, uh, and, and I, I know I can personally vouch for people who did way more destruction of sets than that. Um, you know, a, a collector friend of mine, uh, who we talked about in the last, uh, podcast, uh, who is finding the, uh, the Eisenhower dollar rolls. Um, he, he, he probably broke down 10, 15 times what I did. So, uh, so that's for the, for the Jefferson Nichols, you know, I'm not really concerned so much about the full steps. I think when you're getting into full step territory, you really are talking about certified coins mm -hmm. because it's not just your opinion about the steps. I think to really achieve the value that you're looking for in that situation, you have to go to uh, a third party having that opinion as well. Yeah. Um, I also think that like 
for me, I would rather have a really nice coin without the full steps than to have an MS64 coin with a big hit on Jefferson's cheek that is one of only three that have been certified with full steps. You know what I mean? So it, it, I, I don't fetishize those strike qualities yeah. uh, at, at the at the expense of the overall quality of the piece. Oh, for sure. I, I was just thinking that specifically with Jefferson Nichols, a lot of the early dates, you know, 38, 39, into the 40s, I know that for those coins, it's somewhat harder to find uh, examples with full steps just because nickel's a fairly hard metal and the dyes would wear out relatively quickly. So I know that, you know, if you find 38, 39, some of the forties dates, although the silver, since the, the silver alloy was softer than the nickel alloy, um, you know, that might, you know, that would have an effect, but I, you know, I just knew that some of the earlier ones are hard to find with full steps. So I was just curious if that was uh, something you'd been pursuing, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah, not, not, not specifically. And, and here's another thing though. If, if you, if you, buy i mean we generally think of you know we generally think of uh, mint set coins as being you know sort of the better coins early die state earlier die state uh a real study of the situation will reveal that you can get very early die state coins in circulation um but most of the coins you will find in circulation uh from the 70s and the 80s will be much later die state they really rode those dies uh, to oblivion. Um, this is why you look at something like the 1982 no P uh, a dime, which uh, should have had a P on it, but uh, there was a situation where like one of the dies did not have the P. And then you some as as that die progressed, the date actually starts to wear out to the point where it like they call it the uh, uh, the sort of I think it's called the uh, light date or whatever. I don't know what the nomenclature is, but there's a there's a strong date and a weak date. 82 dime as the die deteriorates, you see the image of the impression get weaker and weaker. Um, so you'll see many circulating coins from this period uh, to be just of, of hideous quality, whereas the mint sets offer more consistently earlier die states of the coins. Um, but when it comes to the 50s issues and the double mint sets, especially in the nickel, you're, you're, you'll actually be shocked when you pull the nickels out and you look at the reverses and see the Monticello. Uh, it, it doesn't even look like it's an uncirculated coin because of how weakly it's impressed with the image because of the state of the dyes they were using by that time before they, you know, created new hubs and, and sort of refresh the design. And, um, it, it's really, it's really something to see. And then as you're putting together your, your album, if you decide to put a complete set of Jefferson Nichols, again, I completely recommend you try. Um, you'll notice that the, the strike characteristics of these coins, uh, change. And, and then as you have them all together in this format, you will see like when new hubs were put into use, you'll see the gradual de decline of the condition of the dies year to year until they rehub the coins. And uh, you'll, you'll get a real good picture of like just the way the coinage looked because you're going to see them side by side by side, mint by mint over a period of years. You know, I imagine the, if someone was really dedicated, you could almost have multiple, you could almost do multiple full collections where you try to get, where you try to get examples of different dates that, sort of typify or exemplify the different die states that i mean it would be, right. it'd be an extraordinarily hard set to or group set or group of sets to put together and it would probably take years if not decades but that could be interesting just to again like you said to kind of illustrate the wearing of the die but anyway right and, and wouldn't that wouldn't that be a, a great meaningful collection that wouldn't really be that expensive to do but would take years to to finish it'd be incredibly meaningful Maybe. i mean I, I could even see that being a cool like exhibit at a coin show like you could I mean, and you could even do that with just focus on one date and just try to get coins from all the different states of the die. Just to, again, just to illustrate how the dies wear, and then and you know and and you know pick out really good examples of different die states, and then have you know uh, high resolution kind of zoomed in images, magnified images um, alongside the actual physical coins themselves, and put them into an exhibit. I think that'd be neat. Yeah, no, I think it'd be fascinating. A second album that I've been putting together for years, this one's actually a little harder than the uh, nickel book, is the Roosevelt Dime mm. uh, with proof-only issues. So although proof issues were struck from 1950 to 1964 uh, in silver, uh, those issues were struck at the Philadelphia Mint, and the Dansko uh, organization of the series doesn't give you a separate spot for those 
uh, coins. So they just expect you to have the the business strike. I guess you could have proofs in there. Uh, but once you get to 1968, the only estimate issues of that year were proof only. Uh, and that carried forward pretty much uh, uninterrupted until you get to 1993, when San Francisco started making silver proof sets in addition to the clad proof sets. So as you uh, can imagine, uh, it's very difficult um, to buy proof issues without buying proof sets, uh, unless you you know find a dealer who breaks them out and sells them as singles. And I haven't really gone that deep into it to try to get every proof clad and silver issue for every date. But I, I have a fairly comprehensive collection of all the... Um, all the mint state issues uh, throughout the uh, series. And it's weird uh, to note this. And I don't think uh, this was the case when I put these coins in the album, but many of my silver coins are now developing uh, rim toning, blue, purple, red rim toning uh, as I put them in the album, even a few of the proof issues. And I think that has something to do with the, the content of the paper. I don't think this is archival paper. So if you are going to put silver coins into albums like this, uh, a bug, or a feature of the situation is uh, expect some tarnish. And I would imagine with uh, modern coins having this uh, 999 fineness uh, that they've switched to, those coins are going to be more reactive to toning than the quote unquote dirty silver of uh, 900 fine. So uh, this, this again, would be a great fun thing to put together. A lot of interesting uh, uh, coins throughout. I think having, seeing the silver coins is always fun. Um, I, like the, the case with the nickels, I, I wasn't really so concerned about full torches. I was just looking for brilliant, original, you know, nice, lustry kind of coins when I put this together. How many, uh, so for any given date in these albums, how many mint sets do you normally have to open before you find coins that either match or that you want to put as your entry for that date? Well, for the period of time that I was working in uh, with the uh, the Ike dollars when I was building that set, so that would be uh, 73 to 78 because they didn't have Ike dollars in 71 or 72 sets. You know, I, I think I was probably, I might have had eight or 10 sets and I would just find the one I liked the most and put it in there. I do have like tubes. I mean, we were talking about the nickels. Um, this is like a whole roll here of 75D nickels all in mint state, you know, and this is like one of probably three or 400 rolls of seventies, eighties period uncirculated coins. I just have like at, at my disposal because I've gone through them. Um, I always feel weird putting any of these kind of coins in circulation because it's almost like you're giving up on a friend that you've, 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 you've sheltered and cared for all of these years, you know, from circulation. But on occasion, you know, like if, um, you know, my kids want to, you know, see a bicentennial quarter or something like that. You know, I might pull one out of one of these tubes and once they handle it enough, I'm like, well, it's changed now. <laughs> so it goes, it goes out in the wild right. and uh, maybe, maybe you'll find a nice nearly mint state, a little bit fingerprinted uh, quarter because I put it out there. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I, th I think like the modern series are definitely worth doing. I mean, you know, obviously like with the, the Washington quarter, we've made so, so complicated due to the, America the Beautiful and State Quarter set. But, you know, I, I do think that, like, if people took Mint State examples of those coins and put them away and put them in these holders, some of those coins probably start toning by now. And I think at some point, toned Washington State Quarters are going to be a real hot collectible thing. Um, the same would go for uh, modern commemoratives. I think if you had a Dance Go album that you kept starting building in the eighties of uh, commemorative coins, proof issues and circulate issues, maybe even more so. And then you started developing these rainbow toning uh, patterns. I think those would sell for a lot of money. I see on eBay, um, the LA Olympics coins from 83, 84, uh, you know, those toned uh, pretty, pretty well. Sellers are asking two, $300 a piece for those coins and uh, getting that number. And if you had a brilliant, you know, white coin uh, as issued in their plastic uh, case, you know, you're looking at a $25, $30 coin. The same would go for an, another coin from that, that period that toned uh, very frequently is the uh, constitutional uh, commemorative dollar. I don't know what it was about the packaging, but those, uh, those toned yellow and red quite frequently. And you see those coins sell not for as much as the uh, LA Olympics coins because the constitutional dollar is not all that attractive a design. And the toning pattern isn't nearly as nice and vivid as you sometimes see with the Olympics coins. But I think that, you know, 
one of the ways to make that toning happen, to be frank, and this isn't cheating or, or using chemistry. It's like just storing the coins in these albums. There's a, there's an expression, uh, called weight Raymond toning, uh, which is a, a common thing you'll see in a lot of modern coins, uncirculated coins that and commemorative coins that were kept in the weight Raymond albums, which were the standard album that was sold, uh, in the, uh, first half of the 20th century. Um, you'll see this type of toning on co classic commemoratives that were kept in their original uh, packaging, uh, especially ones that you see this, these tab, this kind of like this tab toning where there'd be like dark borders and like a little dark spot in the middle. That's uh, based on a, a specific type of, uh, of packaging. But uh, these albums, you know, unless they're inert and, and kept in like an intercept shield or something like that, they will tone your coins. Hardest album, I think, to put together is this one. Uh, so this is the uh, Dansko 7070 United States type. That's that, that's the Dansko. That's the Dansko album I've always wanted to put together. And if I was going to start, that's where I would start. Yeah. So the one I, I ended up buying this album, um, I think for a while they were out of print or Dansko wasn't making them or whatever. And uh, I couldn't buy one on the Internet at the time. But uh, at a local coin show there, they had an auction and somebody was selling a not put together at all. It had like two or three coins in it, 70, 70 album, and it was in good condition. So I bid on it and I won it. It has a page in it that I wasn't, I wasn't accustomed to seeing. It's the last page and it says bicentennial and it has the uh, quarter half dollar dollar plus modern U S coinage. It has an example of a state quarter sack dollar, Susan B. Anthony, which one state would someone pick for their state quarter type? Probably the state they live in, right? Well, assuming it's an American yeah, person well, putting set together. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm Virginia, so I ride and die the Commonwealth. So I have a Virginia state quarter. Oh, see, I, I think I, actually, I, I ride and die the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So there you go. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so this is a 2000s silver uh, state quarter. Actually, this isn't. I, I had nothing to do with that that choice. This was one of the original mm -hmm. coins that came with it. I don't know if you can see in the camera. It actually has the NGC label because <laughs> well, they, yeah. uh, they, they they cracked out a, a proof sixty nine ultra cameo to put it in there. Um, in fact, the, 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 there are a few uh, there are a few coins like that. that I think came with the album. There is an eighteen fifty four half dime, an AU fifty five, a nineteen forty five S nickel from MS sixty six from PC, uh, a, a, a mercury dime, and MS sixty four full bands. Uh, so that was the way that I kind of kept track of what I was putting in the album as I was like, as I was cracking out uh, coins from uh, graded holders so I could be assured that the coins were like not cleaned or fake. Um, I would, I would buy certified coins. I would break them out. I would put them in the holder and I would put the label on the back so that I at least had like an idea of what they were at one point. Now that's not to say that these coins would be graded the same if they were sent back. Uh, they could have uh, deteriorated a little bit since I pulled them out of the holders or whatever. Um, but that's, that's sort of the way I did it. Now what makes this so challenging to be honest with you uh, is the call. This is prohibitively expensive. The United States type coin set, even if you're not going out there and saying gems all across the board, MS65, everything, well, that would be super expensive, right? Because you got to get a gem drape bust uh, cent and drape bust half dollar and trade dollar. And you had to get a gem seat of liberty uh, dollar and, uh, you know, all of that. So what I, what my basic criteria for this set is, and this is why it's taken me a long time is for, for 20th century issues, I'm looking for uncirculated, uh, preferably with luster. I would say MS-63 at, at a minimum, but MS-63 is totally acceptable for like uh, a barber half dollar, uh, any coin that would be over a couple hundred dollars. MS-63 is where I would want to be on that. Uh, for the 19th century issues, what I'm looking for is at a minimum uh, AU-50, AU-55 kind of range. I want to see the design, but you know, this is expensive. So this would be one of those types of sets. If you're going to build it out that you plan around that you say, okay, well, my budget is X for this, the, this, this coin, this coin, this coin, these are my budgets. And then, you know, you're going to be on the lookout when you find something that you can, you can, you can kind of snag at the price you're willing to pay, but you know, you're not going to put this, this album together overnight and you're not going to do it for like fewer than a, probably less than two, $3,000. Uh, 
uh, for like low grade. And if you're going for a higher grade uh, album over the course of many years, this could be ten, fifteen thousand dollar investment. Um, what do you think the best median grade would be if, if someone wanted to put together a seventy seventy with all the coins in the same grade, which might not even be the most attractively matched set, but let's imagine that's what they wanted to do. Which grade do you think would look nice in every single denomination? So the, the trick to that, the first of all, you got to set yourself with the idea that there are certain coins that you're used to seeing in mint state. Mm -hmm. Like you're used to seeing Morgan dollars in mint state. I'm used to seeing Morgan dollars in like 63 to 65 too, like mid, mid mint state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real, like brilliant, uh, right? You're used to seeing, you're used to seeing Lincoln cents in mint state. Depends, uh, it depends like on the state of Lincoln cent though. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're like a memorial cent. You're definitely going to yes. be used to seeing that in state, and, right? And, and, and so what happens? Is, yes, yeah. You, you're right about that. Yeah, and so what happens is when you start putting these coins side by side, because like I mean, I'm looking at the way this book is constituted. You have in the same tab, flying eagle, Indian head, uh, with a laurel wreath, with a copper wreath, with the bronze oak wreath, with the Lincoln head, 1909 VDB, then the bronze 09 to 58. Uh, coin. Mm -hmm. So that's the same tab. My Lincoln scent is like fully brilliant red, like fiery red. My, I have one Indian head there. It's like a 1908 and it's, it's, it's still red, but seeing kind of a dingy flying Eagle scent next to all that would be really kind of disappointing, you know? Oh yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Well, but and similarly, you know, I actually think that, you know, like a, a nicely worn, evenly toned Indian head scent could look really nice and like fine. Oh, certainly they could. Like, like an Indian head gold quarter eagle, for example, in very good or fine. I, I Some of those are cool for low ball sets, but I've never seen heavily circulated gold that's ever been really attractive to me. Yeah. So again, so in terms of grade matching. You'd have to pick a grade that all the coins, if you're going to pick one grade that all the coins would look good in, right? Yeah, because I, I just have the opinion that I think like an AU coin, like if it's nice enough, can kind of pass. Like they used to have a term called slider, super slider kind of coins that are kind of mm -hmm. in between. And and I, I think I think to me, like, you know, you, you expect like a early copper scent to be brown, right? Yeah. But like you kind of want to see all the design details though. And you can't really get that done like any lower than extra fine, 45 maybe, like AU50. I mean, I think that that's where like most of the design details are still relatively apparent. I agree. Circulated copper for me, though, can look very good down to about very good, though. Like I I've seen like, for example, like VF30, VF35, I've seen some fairly pretty uh, bronze small sense in, in VF 30, 35 that aren't bad looking coins by any stretch of the imagination. No, no, not, not at all. I mean, like I said, in the context of putting together a large scent collection mm -hmm. where there are going to be tough dates and they're going to be tough varieties, you're going to say, you know, like a strawberry scent. If you got one that was good for, you'd be like excited. Oh yeah. But, but when you have a type coin, coin set and you're, you're, you're basically the, 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 the condition of putting it together you're sort of expecting that these are going to be examples of each coin they aren't going to be the key dates they're not going to be the semi-key dates they're going to be the affordable available example you're probably going for something as nice as you can get within the grade and that's not going to be the same for everybody like like i i think an a, a problem-free extra fine 45 set would be actually quite cool i mean incredibly cool we, we've even written like the idea of like forget the idea of typeset I, uh, from the notion of getting the affordable example, what would it be like if you had the typeset, but it was the one of the harder coins to get? Like, how neat would it be to open up this and like your example of the Lincoln Memorial sense of fifty five double die? <laughs> you know, I mean, at that point, like you show it off to somebody. Say, well, that wouldn't be the memorial set. Well, well that would be the wheat scent, but but yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, but the wheat scent, the, the double die, or if you get the uh, the buffalo nickel, the type two, it's the it's the three thirty, uh, the three and a half uh, leg uh, buffalo nickel, the three legged nickel. If it's the Washington quarter, it's the thirty two D. You know, if it it, it it would be really funny if if every one of your type coins was either a rare date or a rare variety. Right. That that would be really cool. Right. And That'd it, be a funny set. Yeah, it'd be almost like, hey, you want to see my type set collection? And people look at it and they're like, because you never look for those coins. You never say, oh, wow, your uh, Drape Bus Sense, uh, $17.99. You know, I also love, and, and this would be virtually 
it would, it would be possible to do, but I think it would actually be more difficult than it would seem on the face. I love lowball sets. I get such a kick out of people who put together like like you know the lowest grade coins they can find. But that would be really hard to do for to complete a typeset because you'd have to find a memorial scent graded like fair too, right? Which would be actually insanely hard to find because no one would bother having that coin graded or. I don't know. I just feel like people wouldn't save a memorial scent unless it was a really obscure variety that was really heavily circulated. I feel like they would go for a nicer looking coin. So it would actually be a challenge to find some of the modern, some of the, the most current day issues that were really heavily circulated. Yeah. What, what, what do you think the lowest grade what, what, clad washing quarter you've ever seen in change? You think you've ever found a good or a very good clad washing quarter, like a 65, 66? That, that's a great question because now I'm I'm because I, I get I get 65s in change like like mid late 60s dates relatively often at least back when I was spending cash in stores which yeah and they're pretty beat up at this point oh 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 absolutely no no they're well worn but I don't know that any ever got down below I don't think I've ever found one below fine because because that would have stood out to me because I feel like in change you expect them the clad Washington quarters that I've encountered in, in change from, you know, before the statehood quarters, 99, you know, 98 before, I feel like I always see them at least EF. Like I, 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 I never see them that heavily. Worn. Right. That's, that's an interesting question though. What are the lowest grades you could pull from circulation for any given denomination? Well, well, well that speaks to the, the hardness of the copper nickel clad uh, sandwich metal. You know, the, the fact is that I, I always, I mean, I, I had asked around and I don't know if I ever got like a solid answer. I don't know if there is a solid answer, but it stands a reason that, you know, you have the big coin boom uh, that starts to take place uh, around the time of the Great Depression and people are pulling Indian cents out of change. There's a lot of well-worn 1916D Mercury Dimes, which is amazing, which means 1916D Mercury Dimes probably circulated for at least a decade or two before those coins are pulled out. And, and, you think about though with the silver, the silver is soft enough that the coin kind of wears out pretty quickly. They were complaining that the buffalo nickels, like the dateless buffalo nickels, well, those those nickels were wearing out pretty quickly. They had to continually change uh, the way they were doing that and the Standing Liberty Quarter so that the dates wouldn't be obliterated. So if they were changing the design so the dates wouldn't get obliterated, that means that within a couple, you know, the lifetime of that coin, which is nineteen sixteen to nineteen thirty that the dates were wearing out sufficiently enough that they had to change the design. So I think the silver coins were wearing out faster. Oh, yeah. Well, and silver is a softer metal, so that makes sense. And I mean, yeah, because that's, you know, the the dates are usually so much weaker on pre-1925 um, Sending Liberty Quarters because that's when they recessed the date, right? It was 1925. Mm -hmm. Or that was the first date where the date was recessed. Right, which means that and between then, 1916 and 1924, they recognized the need. Yeah, yeah, in that eight year period, it, they they had a, would have had to have worn out really quickly. No, no, you're right, and that's that that's really really interesting. Yeah, so I mean, and like I said, when you go back to wheat cents, I mean, I would imagine like when you're getting 1950s wheat cents, which are I mean still common enough. I mean, you you yeah. it's not impossible to find them, but but those tend to be in the the extra fine range. It's just like when you start getting into the late 30s, early 40s, like anything be before 1940 is probably going to be in good territory by now. Mm -hmm. You will find 19, uh, 1919 Lincoln wheat cents from time to time because there's a huge mintage that year, but they're going to be good about good at best. Oh, I found it was, it was, it was similar between good and very good. And it was, I don't know if someone polished it or if it went through someone's, you know, like a washing machine, if it was in someone's like pants or something and it, it got washed, it was a hideous coin, but that it was from 1919. I thought it was cool. I mean, I pick out, I mean, look, my standards are so low. I pick bicentennial quarters out of circulation. I mean, they're not worth anything, but I think they're cool. And, you know, that was one of the, that was one of the issues that got me into coin collecting. So if I find them in circulation, I'm pulling them out, even though they're, they're worth 25 cents, but um, yeah. And, and I, I always pick out wheat cents. If I mean, I found wheat cents, 1919 is probably my earliest. I found, we talked about this before. I found 29. I found issues from the thirties and the forties, but forties and fifties wheat cents. I still do find and change from time to time. And I always pull them out. I mean, even if they look terrible, it's just cool that you found it and change. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same would go with nickels. I mean, 
you, you know, you can find a fair amount of nickels like in the, uh, or I would say 60, 62 is probably like your, your typical cutoff date when you're going to find and 64 D's. I mean, they used to be the, about the most common nickel you would ever find in circulation, uh, from the, from that period of time. But, uh, you know, when it, getting back to the, like the whole idea of, 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 of stepping up your collecting from circulation finds to actually paying for the coins and putting them in albums, uh, the album uh, way of putting the coins together allows you to see them in the context of the whole series. And it's, it's certainly a really interesting way to collect and to visualize uh, coins. Uh, having the holes gives you something to chase for. I think having the holes as a concept is what really exploded the popularity of the coin hobby to begin with. I don't think that collecting coins in an album is incongruent with uh, the way uh, coins are typically collected today, which is in certified holders. Uh, I think certified coins are taking an example of the coin that stands out as an individual based on its grade, uh, especially if the coins are snowflakes, which is a term uh, that usually gets used for talking about coins that are individualistic, as opposed to like a dime a dozen type of coin, a widget. But, uh, but so I, I would, I would say that like, to me, a, a candidate for a coin in an album is, is, a, is a nice coin, a coin you'd like to own, but one that maybe doesn't, you know, the, having the determination that it's like an MS 63, as opposed to an MS 64, uh, isn't really that important to you. Uh, but if you had an example that was super gem, you know, uh, MS 67, 68, or, you know, if we're talking about like an 1881 S Morgan dollar or something like that, then it makes no sense to put that coin in an album when it should, the, 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 it's excellent state of preservation should be preserved, uh, in, in an, as inert as possible an environment, which a, a coin uh, encapsulation, uh, would allow. I think putting a registry set together, uh, takes the idea of building a set and amps it up. It provides a social challenge. Other collectors across the country can compete against you. It allows you to show off your coins. Uh, you know, PCGS I know will uh, has a service where they they can they can photograph your coins. You can also upload photographs of your coins to their set registry platform. I considered my Eisenhower dollar, my Washington quarter registry sets to be my ultimate versions of that set. Whereas I considered my uh, Dansko album version to sort of be my, I can look at it at home or I can look at it more easily than pulling out all the blue boxes and pulling out the coins individually. I mean, I went, once I had like my entire quarter set, which I, I had probably 60, 70% of the silver quarters, so like in, in men's state 66. And I had them all laid out like on the floor and like, it, it took like a huge amount of space and it really wasn't a comfortable way for me to like, look at them like as a set. Whereas an album would afford that. And I got more enjoyment looking at my quarters probably through the true views because I had a lot of toners uh, and seeing them in the huge images than I did actually having them and like fiddling with the light and the magnifier or whatever. Well, and, and that's, that's one of the draws of the album, isn't it? Is that it makes presentation easier and it's not an unattractive way to present coins. So it's in, and especially if you have your registry set, that's all, slabbed and, and whatnot, or all the coins in your registry uh, set are slabbed, you know, it, it's cool to have, you know, like you said, sort of a mid-tier set that you can pull out and show to people or just pull out and, and enjoy. I'll say this, we've been talking about, you know, how, um, whether it's a 1962 proof um, Franklin half dollar in a, in a really early uh, PCGS slab or, you know, these coins in a Dansko 7070, the context in which coins are presented matters a lot. And something that I've been getting more and more interested in are coins that come in their original packaging. I know, um, you know, people who've listened to me on this podcast or elsewhere before wouldn't know that I'm really interested in classic commemorative coins, classic commemorative coins with the materials they were issued with, like in the original boxes with the original packaging, original order receipts. There's some, you can build a really cool collection with that too where you have all of the documentation and all of the original packaging. So even though it's not in a slab, it's still being presented in a, in a context that kind of reveals elements of its history, which I think right. is fascinating. Well, I, I agree with that too. I mean, as much, as much as I enjoy looking at the 
uh, known examples of ultra high end coins, especially in that series, especially like the toned ones. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a, just a, I think it's a crime to break out a complete pan pack uh, set with the uh, two gold slugs and uh, to, mm-hmm. to take them out of that, that elegant box that they came in. Um, but you know, at some point that's going to be even rarer than the, uh, than the uh, coins uh, themselves. And uh, which is probably already the case. So anyway, that's uh, that's just sort of like our our kind of feedback about putting coins together in dance go albums. I think we're, what we're going to do with this podcast from time to time is we're going to kind of touch on basic to intermediate collecting strategies and things to to kind of help you see the way we view our collecting pursuits. Kind of give you personal feedback and testimonial. Uh, there really is ultimately no wrong way to experience this hobby, uh, and you'll find that collectors, even collectors who are buying ultra high end very expensive coins have a lot in common with the uh the everyday collector and what drives them to collect the things that they're excited about uh and i want all of our listeners to feel that no matter what we're talking about that they're involved in the broader hobby and uh you know if we ask a a dealer what their tips are for collecting gold coins or why uh maybe an advanced collector might want to hire a coin dealer to represent them and buying coins at an auction. The the basic points and the reasons why these things are happening uh, do uh, have lessons to be learned from everybody. We all uh, are pursuing uh, the objective of uh, enjoying ourselves, learning a little bit about history and putting together the most interesting and lively collection we can within our budgets. And uh, I think uh, there are lessons to be learned at all levels of numismatics and you'll never really stop learning as long as you're curious. And that's absolutely true. And, you know, participating in this podcast and listening to podcasts and consuming different kinds of numismatic media, uh, that can be a a really good way to learn as well. And if I end up getting a 7070, I'll be sure to keep listeners uh, posted as I (laughs) as I fill all the holes. So, you know, you can can come on my 7070 collecting journey with me. Well, and I have it. If any of you would like to start, if you'd like to start a pace, if any of you would like to start with me. You're, you're welcome to. I'll be sure to keep our listeners posted. <laughs> yeah, and do and do feel free to share. You know, on our Facebook page, even we'll post this on our Facebook page. But feel free to share your your strategies, how you put your dance go albums together. I mean, I'm I we read I read every comment, and I'm I'm interested in that dialogue. And I can also tell you on good authority. You know, um, I I know of a collector who put together a collection worth over one hundred million dollars, who still collected coins in albums as well uh, because they wanted something that they could have ready access to, to enjoy the coins because, you know, they had, they could buy every coin that ever came to market, but they couldn't necessarily always have them around uh, due to the obvious, you know, security reasons. So having that album allowed them to flip through the pages and see all the coins that they really loved. And they weren't as nice as the ones they paid Buku bucks for, but they were nice enough to give them that sense of uh, belonging to this hobby uh anytime they wanted to so thank you everybody uh we're going to sign off for tonight and uh, uh we'll be back next week with another episode yeah sounds good thanks so much for listening If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Remember, you can download every episode of the Coin Week podcast for free on the iTunes store. Stream it online on our YouTube channel or on coinweek.com. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting. <laughs>